A few days later, the same day as the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the advocate and others are arrested. They are convicted of unlawful assembly at the high school and sentenced to six months in jail. The sentence is ultimately overturned by a higher court. In 1968, it is a busy year for the advocate. In May, he helps organize the UW Black Student Union to take over President Odegaard's office and presents five demands for better representation, relevant classes, and recruiting of underrepresented minorities. The university meets all the demands. Also in 1968, White Bear begins his work unifying all Indians and holds the first of the large powwows at the Seattle Arena. White Bear's next major effort is the invasion of Fort Lawton in 1970 to reclaim Indian land. Armed troops and police arrive, and he is put in the stockade for a short time. The occupation lasts three months, during which time White Bear is advised to found an organization for greater power and visibility in the struggle. So, during the 1970 Fort Lawton invasion, White Bear founds United Indians of All Tribes Foundation and becomes its first executive director of the nonprofit organization. Under his leadership, it eventually focuses its efforts on promoting cultural, economic, and social welfare for all Indians in Puget Sound. Meanwhile, that same year, The Advocate graduates from the UW and is hired by Dr. Samuel Kelly, the vice president of the newly founded Office of Minority Affairs. His job is to oversee the Black Student Division. 1971 brings a victory to White Bear as the United Indians of All Tribes Foundation officially receives 20 acres of land at Fort Lawton for a proposed cultural center. In 1972, The Gatherer becomes executive director of the International District Improvement Association known as Interim. Yeah. He becomes a pivotal liaison between community activists, private business, and government agencies. He leads efforts to preserve the International District, provide services to its residents, and sustain affordable housing. Also in 1972, our fourth galactic hero, El Fuego, the fire, makes his major move in Seattle. With his powers of fiery passion, collective engagement, and gregariousness, posing as not-so-mild-mannered Latino Roberto Maestis. Up to this point, El Fuego is a teacher, gaining insight and formulating his plan for action. In fact, four years earlier, he is the only teacher at Franklin High to stay during the sit-in. His official super superhero power begins when he leads Chicano activists in occupying the abandoned Beacon Hill School. Learning from White Bear's occupation of Fort Lawton that there is strength in numbers, El Fuego invites all people of color to join him. White Bear, the Gatherer, and the Advocate do so. Following the successful occupation, El Fuego opens El Centro de la Raza to help Latinos and people of all color empower themselves and encourage basic social change. Mm -hmm. In late 1972, The Gatherer sets out to mitigate the impacts of the Kingdom on the International District and Pioneer Square. Interim works behind the scenes with various citizen groups while young activists demonstrate at the November groundbreaking. Days later, protesters march to a meeting at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, shouting and holding signs the most famous, Humbows, not hot dogs! Using the Asian pork bun to emphasize the importance of preserving the Asian culture and traditions of the International District. Captain, are you insinuating I don't know humbows? Well, I thought from your planet. Oh, perhaps... I know humbows. <laughs> Let's move on. Anyway. <clears throat> Other minority groups led by El Fuego and the Advocate join in support. Meantime, there are more victories for White Bear and the tribes. In 1974, the U.S. District Court rules the tribes are entitled to one half of the harvestable salmon running in their traditional waters. In the years following the decision, indeed, indeed. 
In the years following this decision, Puget Sound Indians make economic, social, and cultural gains. In 1977, a Native American cultural center, the Daybreak Star Center, opens on reclaimed Indian land at Fort Lawton. Now, 1977, our four superheroes have been fighting against the powers of injustice for many years. Even with their immense superpowers and their mighty friendship, they are beginning to grow weary of the constant struggles. Understanding that unity is power, they decide to formally band together as a super team. As their alter egos, Larry, Roberto, Bob, and Bernie, they decide to call themselves the Four Amigos. Because the Fantastic Four sounds a little too pretentious. Yes, just a little bit. <laughs> they join the work of Making Our Votes Effective, the first major registration effort to encourage people of color to vote. They create social change from the ballot box during the 1977 mayoral race and help elect Charles Royer as mayor of Seattle. Royer credits this support with turning the tide in his favor. Then, in 1979, The Advocate becomes the executive director of the Central Area Motivation Program. Or CAMP. Yes. CAMP, yes. A community action agency designed to fight poverty. In 1981, the Four Amigos create the Minority Executive Directors Coalition for executive directors of nonprofit organizations that serve people of color and are dedicated to equity, equality, and social justice. Because of the vast powers created as a result of coming together and constantly living in fear that someone will discover their secret superhero identities, the four come up with a brilliant idea to convince the public that they are just simple, mediocre humans. They call their plan Community Show Off. Oh, yes. Those boys can shake it. True that, Captain. And nothing says mediocre like a night of prominent citizens acting and, uh, <clears throat> dancing on stage. And so their secret identities are safe. Now, throughout the 1980s and 90s, the efforts of the four continue. El Fuego works tirelessly as the director of El Centro de la Raza creating cultural awareness with programs and services to empower people of color. White Bear tracks state and local legislation that impacts ethnic and minority communities and lobbies for their rights. He also shares his love and what little he has in his pocketbook with anyone who looks like they need help. The advocate moves from camp when he is elected to serve on the King County Council. He brings his knowledge in support of communities of color and the less fortunate to bring about policy change. The Gatherer oversees the Seattle Chinatown International District Preservation Authority and is appointed by President Clinton as Regional Director of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. This work enables the four superheroes, yes, to affect change with national organiza organizations and policymakers. And all the while, each superhero mentors a new generation of young activists. But even a superhero cannot fight all the unfairnesses of the world. And so it is for White Bear, who valiantly wages war against another cruel and dark presence, cancer. In 2000, after a three-year fight, White Bear loses the battle. More than 6,400 people attend White Bear's funeral at the Washington State Convention Center. The Gatherer, El Fuego, and the Advocate are his pallbearers. As the doors open following the service, a huge gust of wind blows into the center and up to the ceiling. White Bear's spirit is rising. So today, all you need to do is look around this city to know that the legend of the four superheroes lives on. Interim and the International District are thriving. More than a dozen organizations dedicated to the well-being of Asian American and Pacific Islanders thrive. El Centro de la Raza continues offering comprehensive services and programs that empower Hispanics and promote community building. Daybreak Star remains the hub of Native American cultural activity and continues to host its annual powwow. 
Camp continues to meet the evolving needs of the community and improve the lives of African Americans and of all those living in the Central District. Between 1968 and 2007, the University of Washington awards nearly 24,000 undergraduate degrees to students of color who are part of the school's educational opportunity program. MEDC maintains its position as the region's broadest based and oldest multi-ethnic coalition of its kind. And the next generation of leaders, including many women, are following in their mentors' footsteps as heads of nonprofit organizations, lawyers advocating for others, politicians representing people of color, and just everyday people working to find justice and opportunity for all. This is the living legacy and amazing story of four superheroes. White Bear. The Gatherer. The Advocate and El Fuego, Seattle's Fantastic Four. put me on at this stage of the program? <laughs> I don't know about this. I have one announcement before I get into my remarks. Uh, Bernie and Lonnie, uh, speaking on behalf of Bernie and Larry and Bob Santos and Roberto, will not use the mic because they don't know how. They will use a bullhorn. <laughs> that bullhorn represents something for me because when I first came onto the campus of the University of Washington, I worked as a reporter for KIXI Radio. I used to cover the sit-ins. I used to cover the arrests. I used to cover all those things. Uh, I had the honor of getting to watch <laughs> and not being arrested as we moved through those processes. I came to know Larry uh, by marriage. Uh, Larry used to date that beautiful Rhonda Odin who used to take care of our son, me, and, and I used to see him not as the activist, but as the suitor. Then uh, he and I got selected to be on the board of the Urban League in the under 40, and Larry and I got the opportunity to go to the National Urban League's St. Louis Convention when Vernon Jordan first made his speech. It was there that we uh, found a friendship that has lasted forever, and it really means a lot in every sense of the word. Bernie, uh, I met him through Rainer Bank and looking at Daybreak Star and getting corporate contributions in the job that I used to have and learning how much of that passion really made a difference. Bob, I resent somewhat because he had the title of the mayor of International District Chinatown and he would never let me stand alone as mayor uh, when I was down there. But I do remember when the International District rose up to talk about and to protect the rights of an encroaching kingdom to make sure that everybody saw the sense of what a community was and where they moved and so it wasn't but not by any accident that I uh, opened up my campaign headquarters in the international district where I had lots of humbug. <laughs> Roberto in so many ways uh, I used to cover when they occupied El Centro and wonder what was going to happen there but then Roberto taught me uh, the things that I needed to do as a corporate uh, contribution specialist and making sure that we were giving dollars and funds. 
for the things that are so much important to the Latino Hispanic community. When I decided to run for mayor the successful time, <laughs> uh, I created a steering committee and there were lots of people when I opened up the steering committee, there was Bernie, there was Roberto, there was Larry, and there was uh, Bob Santos. And someone came up to me, they don't know this, and said, why do you have them on your steering committee? What kind of message will that send? And I said, it's the message that collectively and individually that they believe in. They believe in making sure that you adhere to your heart, your mind, and your soul. And what they do and what they believe in is making sure that all of us are connected to the value of a human being and the opportunity for someone to rise and to be what they want to be and to make sure that there are champions speaking every day for that opportunity. Never... never retreating and never really make, making sure that any politician escapes or gets off the hook. They keep us honest, they keep us focused, and they make us remember. It's about our past, it's about our present, and it's about our future, and they have laid a legacy that makes us all aspire to do our best. So I'm really honored that I could be a part of a wonderful, wonderful program that recognizes something that is probably even more intangible than any of us know, the legacy that they've given to so many people who are better citizens, better families, better wage earners, better people making a difference in this community. We say thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jane Lewis, and I'm chair of the board of directors of the YMCA of Greater Seattle. It is my privilege today to pre present the AK Guy Award to our honorees. I would like, please, to ask Bob, Larry, Roberto, and on behalf of Bernie, his brother Lonnie Reyes, to please join me. Gentlemen, on behalf of the YMCA of Greater Seattle and the Guy family, we are so pleased to present to you today the 2009 AK Guy Award for your commitment to communities that are fair and just and for being role models for so many. Each of you will receive this crystal keepsake as a memento of our admiration and our thanks. Thank you very much. Congratulations. The microphone is theirs. I, I want to thank uh, the AK a Guy Award Committee, they really, you know, they don't Twitter to get you people here. They meet. 
two, three times a week, and, and uh, we, we've been witness to that. So thank you to the staff and to the YMCA. I want to thank um, my wife, Sharon Tomiko, for being here. Uh, right there. Uh, my father-in-law, Ken Miyake, my sister-in-law. My kids are in a, sitting at that table at the end. My six children. And I want to also thank uh, Ruth Wu for being here and, uh, and uh, Eddie Rye and some of these other folks. And the interim table, my old agency, they're over here. And I want to, I want to thank Joe Malahan for being here. He, he, Joe's at the table with the family, and we appreciate his uh, presence here today. Now, I, I was supposed to say a few words, but uh, Steve and I uh, are putting together this uh, something that will probably, um, you'll get the feeling of what I feel for today. Steve, are we ready? <laughs> we rehearsed this earlier. <laughs> By uh, Louis Armstrong. I see trees of green. Red roses too, I see them blue for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue and clouds of white. The bright blessed day, the dark sacred night, and I...